today on The Novelizers. From Catastrophe, Rob Delaney, narrating a chapter by The Tonight Show's Chase Mitchell, plus an interview with Seth Morris. Let's do this. Don't want your popcorn, don't want your milk duds, don't want my shoes stuck in pools of sticky cola. Don't show me romance, don't show me fist fights, just show me words pretty loud under the book light. Yeah, baby, now lies the movie. Give me sentences, paragraphs, and nothing to see. Yeah, now lies the movie. Write a book and turn it into a Welcome to The Novelizers, a podcast where we take classic films, get TV writers to turn them into funny books, which we then get your favorite actors and comedians to narrate. This season on the podcast, we're novelizing The Matrix, a groundbreaking film that blew minds and got an entire generation to question reality. Starring Keanu Reeves, the film premiered in... Huh. A call from a number I don't recognize. I better interrupt the show to take it. This is Andy. Yeah? (sighs) Yes, Mr. President, I understand. Right away, sir. Thank you, sir. I won't let you down. Kevin, come quick. Uh, your your dry cleaner said your boxers won't be ready till... Fuck the dry cleaning. I just got a call from the president of Procter & Gamble. He needs me to film an ad for Metamucil in Singapore. I leave at once. Oh, uh, well, when, when will you be back? Kevin, I'm afraid this is a one-way mission, which means the podcast is in your hands now. What? I don't don't know how to run a podcast. I don't even know the first thing about... Shh. Paint my fence. What? Paint my fence, just like I showed you how to do every weekend for the past year. Uh, okay. Up, down, up, down. Oh, fuck it. Yeah, I guess that skill's not really relevant. Anyway, it's just a podcast. You know, Joe Rogan has one. How hard can it really be? Plus, you won't be alone. You'll have the show producer helping you out every step of the way. Say hi to Steven Levinson. We have a producer? Uh, Andy, I I don't know if this is such a good idea. Well, how's this for an idea? You'll also have help from Christine Bullen, whom I met the other week at UCB. Wait, I've never novelized, like, anything before. Andy, I don't even know where the record button... Looks like my ride's here. Richter, out. Wait, wait. I was supposed to get a college credit for my internship. I think you need to sign this form. What? I can't hear you because of this helicopter. Goodbye. I believe in you, Evan. It's Kevin. Well, welcome to the Novelizers. I guess I'm your intern slash co-host, Kevin Carter. Here with Steven and Christine, and this season, we're novelizing The Matrix. Yeah. um, Our first chapter was novelized by Chase Mitchell, who has written for The Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon and Inside Job, and is narrated by Rob Delaney from Catastrophe, Mission Impossible, Dead Reckoning, and a hilarious stand-up special available on Amazon Prime. Rob Delaney, novelize us. Chapter 1. Tonight, we're dodging bullets like it's 1999. Novelized by Chase Mitchell, narrated by Rob Delaney. The year is 1999. Or, it's the future. Or, we're in the future, but we think it's the past. Which is our present. The setting, Australia. Or, a city in Australia that's supposed to look like America. Or, a computer simulation that's supposed to look like a city in America, but really looks like a city in Australia, trying to look like America. Got it? We open on a wall of green text, but not that really annoying kind of green text you see when you're on a group chat and one of your friends has an Android. Just get a fucking iPhone, Andrew. We're not impressed that you're a nonconformist. Then the music kicks in, which sounds like it's being performed by an orchestra called Oops, All Trumpets. To be fair, the Wachowskis blew most of the budget on special effects, so they had to hire a high school marching band. We slowly zoom in on this mysterious green scrolling text, which is written in some kind of language other than English. So, as an American, I proudly refuse to understand it. By the way, you're going to want to get used to the color green, because this entire movie looks like it was shot through the bottom of a rolling rock bottle. The green text slowly begins to spell out the words, The Matrix. Boom. Title of the movie. A little disappointed, because I was told I'd be writing a novelization of the lesser-known Matrix porn parody, The Eight Dicks. But this is okay, too. We cut to a shot of an empty screen with a single blinking cursor. 
which, as any employed screenwriter sitting in a Starbucks right now knows, is the scariest fucking thing in the world. By the way, if that's you, shut this podcast off and get back to work. That indie rom-com that's secretly about the cute barista isn't going to get rejected by A24 by itself. Anyway, yeah, the blinking cursor. Very ominous. You have to remember this was 1999, right before the start of the new millennium, or willennium as we called it, and we were all afraid of computers because some guy on TV told us the world was going to end at New Year's because our IMAX didn't know what the number 2000 is. It was a scary time. Kids were playing with Tamagotchis, and the most trusted name in news was Carson Daly. So as the cursor continues to blink, we hear a conversation between two people. One who sounds an awful lot like bald character actor Joe Pantoliano, still years away from having his head cut off on The Sopranos, and a female voice who sounds a lot like the actress who won't return my fan mail, Carrie Ann Moss. He says, you weren't supposed to relieve me. She says, I know, but I felt like taking a shift. So either we're listening to the riveting opening dialogue of a modern day sci-fi classic or a break room conversation at GameStop. As they talk, we see that the call is being traced. The rapidly scrolling digits on the screen begin to narrow down to what appears to be a phone number. And before you get too excited, it's not Carrie Ann Moss's personal cell. I've already tried 11 times. Pantoliano continues, you like him, don't you? You like watching him. And whoa, we are less than one minute into this movie and it's already getting horny. Somebody make sure Joey Pants is wearing actual pants. The conversation continues. He says, we're gonna kill him. You understand that? She says, Morpheus believes he is the one. He says, do you? She says, it doesn't matter what I believe. He says, you don't, do you? So wait a minute. She's obsessed with him, but she also doesn't think he's the one? I'll never understand women. Suddenly there's a slight click and her tone changes. Did you hear that? She says, very paranoidly. Are you sure this line is clean? He says, yeah, of course I'm sure. She says, I better go. Carrie Ann Moss abruptly hangs up the phone, something I'm very used to experiencing. As the camera continues to zoom in on the number zero to symbolize how much sense this story makes so far, we zoom back out to reveal a flashlight. Not a flashlight, but if this movie gets any hornier, I wouldn't be surprised. We see several police officers walking down a dark hallway, doing that thing that movie cops do where you hold out a gun and a flashlight at the same time, like you're looking for a very dangerous spider. Pretty soon they converge on a particularly filthy, crust-covered door and… Hey, I think I recognize this place. Is this the Motel 6 off the Jersey Turnpike? I used to, um, have uh, business meetings there. The officers kick down the door and barge into the room with their guns drawn on a single unarmed woman, a tactical maneuver which has historically ended very well for everyone. The woman stands up from her computer. This is Trinity, as in the father, the son, and the holy crap, she's hot. We cut back outside to see the name of this fine, upstanding establishment, Heart of the City Motel, which sounds like a place where leprechauns get foot jobs. As the rain pours down from the onset rain machine, a black sedan pulls up and several men climb out wearing dark suits and sunglasses. Sort of like if Men in Black starred four Tommy Lee Joneses. The Tommy Lee Jonesiest of the bunch addresses one of the cops, scolding him for not waiting for them to show up. The cop shoots back, I'm just doing my job. You give me any of that juris my diction crap, you can cram it up your ass. And sure, he sounds a little arrogant, but he did just squeeze two body parts into one insult, and that's not easy. Back inside, the cops inch closer to T, who's dressed in the latest fall look from Hot Topic's formal wear collection. She looks like a dominatrix who's also a mom. A mominatrix? Anyway, one guy breaks out some handcuffs, and you can tell this isn't the first time that's happened in this motel room. But just when they think they've got her cornered, Carrie Ann Moss turns and fights back, immediately breaking one cop's arm with her sexy karate. He screams out, No! That's my suspect beaten arm! as she shoves her palm up into his nose, making him look, ironically, like a pig. Then comes the money shot. Not like that, pervert. As she leaps high into the air, and time freezes around her in this incredible, jaw-droppingly cinematic way you're just gonna have to take my word for, since this is an audio medium. I mean, wow, it looks amazing. You're really missing out. It's the kind of visual so iconic it eventually gets parodied in a Shrek movie. She kicks the cop clear across the room, right into the wall, then quickly finishes off the rest of the police officers. She kicks a chair at another cop, like the world's sexiest lion tamer, then scurries up the wall away from them, like the world's sexiest cockroach. He then shoots the second to last cop with another cop's gun, aka the perfect crime, then kicks the last officer by raising her leg so high it looks like a special effect. And I'll just be screenshotting that and saving it for later. Now panicking as she realizes she just casually murdered a whole Brooklyn Nine-Nine's worth of police officers, she pulls out a flip phone. 
a primitive device unlike phones of today, in that it is primarily used as a phone, and calls out an unseen contact named Morpheus. She stammers, the line was traced, I don't know how, which is also a handy phrase to use if you ever get caught cheating in art school. The voice on the other end of the phone tells her there's agents coming, and that she'll have to find another exit. She walks back out into the hallway, and as the agents get off the elevator, she runs as fast as she can in the other direction, which is how I react when my agent is walking towards me. She bolts up through the motel hallways faster than I did that time I tried to pay for sex with a Dave & Buster's gift card, which is just as good as money, by the way, and out onto the rooftops above, while the agents and police officers who haven't gotten their asses kicked yet give chase. She clambers up one metal rooftop and down another as the police officers huff and puff and struggle to keep up. Which is a good reminder, kids. Never stop for Duncan on your way to arrest a cyber-terrorist time ninja who knows parkour. Suddenly, as she reaches the edge of one rooftop, she hurls herself through the air from one building to another, a distance way too far for any normal white person to be capable of. The only one able to jump after her is the suit-and-tie-clad agent, flying through the air like a super-powered stockbroker. She leaps through the air sideways like the world's sexiest lawn dart, then crashes through a window and down some stairs like the world's sexiest slinky. She lands with her guns pointed at the window she just crashed through, and yells at herself to get up and keep going, which is more motivation than I've ever had to do anything. I'm recording this lying down, for God's sake. Thanks to his superpowers within the Matrix, combined with whatever quality meth that truck driver had been on, Agent Smith emerges from the 18-wheeler unscathed. We'll need a search running. It has already begun. Thank you, Rob Delaney and Chase Mitchell. The Novelizers is an indie podcast, and we can't keep this show going without your help. For just 12 bucks a year, that's less than a movie ticket, you can keep us making episodes all year long. And you will never have to go to the movies again. So if you're enjoying the podcast, look us up on Patreon, sign up, pitch in a buck, and thank you. Every week on The Novelizers, we interview someone who actually worked on the film The Matrix. Kevin, who'd you talk to this week? This week, I talked to Seth Morris, who had a very cool job on the set of The Matrix. Awesome. Take it away. Hey, everybody. Uh, Kevin Carter here, and I am joined by the wonderful Seth Morris, who is the squatting coach for the movie The Matrix. Seth, how's it going, man? It's going great, mate. How are you? I'm doing all right. Uh, not to correct you, but I'm only a Keanu squatting coach. Uh, to be clear, you know, I only worked there. It was a very specialized film. You know, everybody mm -hmm. had their role. Mm -hmm. And my role was in the beginning of the film when Keanu receives, I'm sorry, when uh, uh, his character receives the flip phone and uh, Morpheus is on the other line saying, I'm going to get you out of here, mm -hmm. run down the corridor. Uh -huh. He head low, and he has to squat through the cubicles. Yep, that was my job was to help him do that. Yeah, um, I'm I'm glad I'm talking to you because uh, I've seen that part hundreds of times, and I actually tried to do that in the workout uh, with my with my coach, with my workout trainer. I told him I want to do the Keanu, you know, I said yeah. I want to do the cubicle. I call it the cubicle. I like right. I want to do the cubicle, right. and um, I can never I can never complete it. Yeah, I can never really do it. Well, here's the thing. Here's the thing, mate. Americans can't squat. Right, it's something mm -hmm. that, that, that that in Australia, it's a big it's a big part of what we do. It comes from sheep herding and being part of the prison population that first inhabited the islands. Mm -hmm. Keanu had no idea. And first, they tried lots of different things. They they shot that 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 sequence with CGI, a lot of blue screen, a lot of wires, a lot of really, uh, yeah. And uh, it just didn't look right. And the Wachowski siblings, you know, they're perfectionists. They had spent a lot of money on this. And then they said, we need a squat guy. And uh, I don't come cheap, mate. I'll be honest. I don't come cheap. But they brought me in. And uh, so we shut down production for four months. And Keanu and I just hit the gym. We got in there. And uh, we went at it. And I, I, I'm, I'm proud to say the results speak for themselves. So how 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 many hours was that like training for that? Did did he get it right away, or did it really take some 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 training for him? No, no, no. He did not get it right away. Uh, nobody does actually. Mm -hmm. uh, this was uh, you know we start very slow. We first we start sitting. Okay, so the first couple of weeks we're just sitting, so he can remember what that he gets that muscle memory in his legs and his musculature. So you want him, you want him to remember how to sit? Well, not him. His muscles. You know, your muscles have brains. Your muscles have a memory and therefore they have brains. Mm -hmm. So we had to use his muscle brains uh, uh, in, in such a way that they, and then in turn his 
head brain would remember uh-huh. what the what this physicality was like. Okay, uh-huh. and so we we sh- we shot the sequence where I would push him around in a chair, and uh, and eventually we we moved him off of the chair, and he would be on his knees just so he could get his head level because it can be very disorienting to have your uh-huh. head way up high. He's about six three. Keanu is. Okay. And, didn't know that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people think he's short. He looks very, he reads very short. He reads is about five, six at the most. Yeah. The way he walks, he walks like he's short for some reason. So yeah, I understand what you're saying. But uh, rather tall bloke. And uh, anyway, we, we the next thing was to get his head equilibrium because you know, you've got, you've got juice in your brain, you've got fluid in your skull and your brain floats around there not to get too technical oh you can get as technical as you want we're here to hear it all oh great okay well uh you know the brain the skull is made primarily of calcium and salts and uh inside that is a is a as a pool of uh, essentially water let's be honest uh and your brain floats around in that so when you move your brain moves kind of squiggly squishy squishy right so when you go from standing up to squatting there's a it's kind of like a it's kind of like Wiley e. Coyote on a cliff. There's a part of your brain that is still there, kind of dangling in midair when you first squat down. Okay, you understand the metaphor? Uh, yeah, I'm getting there. You know, you're okay. doing a great job. I understand what exactly what you're saying. Thank you. And so we had to get used to the brain moving from high up six three to down to about three mm-hmm. four. So in, in just answer your question, yeah, that that's now we're in about month two and a half of a four month process and uh and eventually he got it and you know uh, uh some of that too is just it can be very emasculating to learn how to squat and uh Keanu I, I, I don't know if you remember but he hadn't had a hit film in a long time Matrix is kind of his comeback yeah yeah um I, I think I agree I think it I think if I'm mistaken I, I can't remember if this was before or after the replacements but um yeah it, I, I can definitely see the Matrix being his comeback for sure Oh, he made. Let's be honest. Let's be honest. He made a lot of turds. He made the the the, the replacements. He made the um, what's the devil movie with uh, Al Pacino? He made a turd with Al Pacino. A real turd of a movie. I don't. I have no idea what he did in his spare time. You know. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. okay, yeah. My apologies. That era of actor of Al Pacino making turds seems like you know there's a lot of cocaine, lots of crazy things back in the day. Who knows what those people are into? Yeah. A turd of a film. So my point was, he really needed this to be a hit, you know, and he would say to me, see it, I need this to be a hit, just like that. So how, did you feel the pressure? You know, did you feel any pressure knowing, hey, I got this guy to work because this is, I'm, I'm, I'm essentially saving, you know, saying Keanu Reeves' life right now. I, this, this has to work. Was there any pressure for you? Well, there's a, there's a lot of pressure, but you can't show that, you know. Keanu, as you can probably imagine, is very sensitive person yes. so if i showed the slightest bit of uh, uh of of reciprocal stress he would just literally collapse he would fawn you know he's fight flight or freeze a lot of people don't know that fawning is part of that he would just drop like a possum and and like stick his little like it was cartoonish he would fall on his back and expose his his uh you know his tender parts his his belly and his neck in a submissive pose to the point where look Pale, you gotta be an action hero here. Uh-huh. You gotta, you, you're Neo, okay? You gotta try to, uh, uh, to well, for lack of a better word, man up. Yeah, you know. So I, I learned to, to, to suppress that. But yeah, honestly, it did, uh, it did affect me. It was much like uh, being undercover. You know, uh-huh. some of these undercover films where they, they, they go home and they're drinking a lot. And they're, you know, because you have to be two people. Kind of in, in in one life. I agree. It, se- it seems like you two maybe kind of bonded, you know, saying through this training process. Was there did y'all bond a little bit, or was there anything you know, was like outside of the training you guys were able to to hang out or do something like that? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I introduced him to motorcycle riding. Uh, Keanu, uh, the only thing that relaxes him is a good wrestle. A good wrestle. Uh, if he got too stressed out, he'd say, "Hey, can we?" Uh, can we go play a little grab ass, a little wrestling? You know, we just like 12 year old boys at a slumber party. We just start wrestling and, you know, just kind of like do typewriter torches and, 
just just silly games like that, but physicality would just kind of get get some of that stuff out. Tickle fonts, things like is gra- that. Is grab assing? Is grab is that what they call it in Australia? Like cause that, cause when I when I think of grab assing, I think of wrestling. I think of two separate things. Well, I'm I'm saying I'm just distinguishing like you know wrestling from like uh, uh, an organized sport to just like how you would with your mates when you're a kid, you know, or your dad or something. When you just kind of goofing around you might fight on each other's heads or something like that or they'll like punch each other in the balls or something wow okay yeah that um goofy yeah real real goofy um i got a question for you um i didn't ask nobody this before and i want to i want to get the inside scoop from you if, if you don't mind um working with keanu that long four months you know so just you and him squatting sitting things like that did he ever smile you know that's an interesting question no he didn't damn it I'm trying. I'm trying to find somebody that's seen this guy smile before, and I haven't met a person that's done it yet. Yeah, you'd think for such an in- international style, right? He's got so much charisma. Uh, he doesn't smile. Very sad man, I would say. Ugh. Very, uh, very introspective. Uh-huh. Uh, and I, honestly, I think it's because of the name. You know, he's yeah. had a bizarre name. I'm sure he was T relentlessly for it as a kid. Yeah, and. Uh, but you know he's like he's got kind of that sad puppy dog energy where you just want to help him, right? And it, I'll, I'll be honest, it's disarming to tickle someone, and he's he'll giggle like a little girl, but there's no smile. It's just a straight face and a giggle. Oh yeah, can you imagine? It's like an uncanny valley kind of situation because like, you know, I know we're having fun here. That sounds horrific. I'm using my best tickly fingers and. Uh, and 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 he doesn't even get an eye crinkle. I'm sorry you. Uh, I'm sorry you had to deal with that. Um, it must be. It must be rough. You know, so trying to tickle somebody. Honestly, that's what led. Yeah, that was a big part of it. You know, I yeah. talk about emasculating. I'm listen. I'm known in my family, in in among my my friend group, and professionally, I got the best tickly fingers out there. I can tickle anybody. I can get a laugh out of anybody. And uh, I a lot of this is just coming up now. I haven't. I, I'm Kevin. I appreciate talking to you yeah. about this yeah, because. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's some trauma to unpack here. To Listen, be honest, it's, it's okay to it's okay to be open. You know, and this is this is this is your time. You know, this is a safe space. Um, you know, we can we can we can listen. We can vibe out. You know, and we can we can cry. You know, this is your space. You know, I'd love to vibe out a little bit because you know, you know, as a sporting coach, you know, I, again, as you can imagine, I have massive massive thighs, a rock hard glutes. Mm-hmm. Okay, mm-hmm. so people see that it's like a you know, and uh, and I'm a, I could be a physically imposing person, mm-hmm. and much so in reverse of like what a lot of guys at the gym they just do the upper body and their pencil legs. Yeah. I'm the opposite. I've got huge legs. My upper body looks like uh, you know al dente pasta. So you, but, uh, so you look like uh, Squibber when he ate all the Krabby Patties. There you go. All there right. you go. Makes sense. Exactly. You get the reference mm-hmm. here. I can be physically imposing. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, like I say, the, my lower half is all business and my upper half's all fun. That's why I, I tickle with my fingers, right? That's why I get those tickly fingers. And uh, it was just very disarming. You know, you think of yourself as one way and then you deal with this one kind of, uh, this uncrackable, uh, I would say Keanu's armpits are like my Moby Dick. Well, I, don't, I do not know that reference, sir. Well, Moby Dick is my, you know, the one kind of the one that got away this this mythical gotcha. beast that I couldn't tackle. Gotcha, right? Mm-hmm. And that's what his armpits is like: two moist, uh, hairy whales that I could never hop in. I must say, just hearing, you know, saying the the size of you when it comes to, you know, saying the the thighs and and the glutes and everything like that. If I'm being honest, Keanu Reeves didn't really look like somebody who would be doing four months of squatting training is was that purposeful did you want to make keep him lean or what or did he not just get there yet i know we had to keep him lean you know in fact we'd uh you know his thighs got so big we'd have to stretch him out stretch him out on a rack to like uh you know to elongate the muscles mm-hmm. kind of like you know it's like the body's much like a tube of toothpaste if it want if you if it gets big on one end you got to squish it out to like you know even out the goo inside so he'd have so much leg goo at the end of the day that i would what i would do is i would roll on top of him like a pizza roller and i'd squish some of that leg goo up into his torso and his uh you know his arms Mm -hmm. so you get that lean kind of uh those thin sinewy muscles yeah you you'll be surprised how much goo is in this movie and how much 
Goo is a part of the process of making this movie. You would you would be blown away if I told you how much Goo I know about. Oh yeah. Well, everybody knows that about you, Kev. You know all about the Goo. Yep, I, I'm I'm the Goo guy. You're the Goo guy. So if you don't mind, real quick, um, what got you into like squatting and weights and and in doing this? What what got you down down this path? What happened was uh, I was working out late in the gym by myself one time, training really hard, uh-huh. and I was doing squats. Okay. And um, I was stupid, very stupid. I wasn't using a squat rack. I just had it on myself and uh, I got stuck. I squatted down and I got stuck in that position. And I'll be honest, Kevin, I was there till the next morning uh, because I was too, uh, I was too egotistical to cry for help. Uh And so throughout the night, my legs got bigger and bigger. I was stuck that way. I, I, you you know, Keanu, a Neo uh-huh. squats through that, those cubicles in the film. That was me for about a year. That's how I walk. Oh, really? And, you know, it's one of these weird life things where the worst thing that happens to you is somehow in a weird way, you know, you wouldn't change it because it, it changed your life for the better. Uh-huh. Uh, I had to overcome a lot for that. Uh, uh, I, I first doctor said I'd never be able to stand upright again. Oh, wow. But through a lot of training, a lot of massage, uh-huh. uh, and the right vitamins, I was able to, uh, you know, eventually squat a little less and a little less. And before long, I was standing. And uh, and then, I, you know, up naturally, I, I vowed never to squat again. Uh, but one time, I uh, I dropped some peanut butter pretzels, and I was really hot. I didn't even think about it. I squatted down to get them. And, I, and when I went down, I said, oh, God. And uh, I didn't think I'd be able to get back up. And then I was able to get back up. And it turned out that, again, that muscle memory, those muscle brains. Uh-huh. And I was able to remember how to do both things. Seth, I want to thank you for a wonderful, uh, interesting conversation. This is where I'm going to do some squats, work on my glutes as soon as right after this interview. Uh, I want to thank you for showing up today. Uh, everybody, please enjoy the rest of the podcast. I've been Kevin Carter. And that's our show for today. Thanks for joining. Join us next time when we'll have a chapter from the man behind the Tweet of God Twitter account with over 6 million followers. That's bigger than some religions. David Jabberbaum. Stephen, unplug us from the Matrix. Sure thing, Kevin. Special thanks to this week's guests, Rob Delaney, Chase Mitchell, and Seth Morris. The Novelizers is produced by me, Stephen Levinson, with Graham Douglas, Kevin Carter, Christine Bullen, Dennis DeClaudio, Rob Kuttner, and Suchetis Bokil. Music by Cole Emhoff. Graphic design by Crystal Dennis. Theme song by Andrew Lynn, performed by Knotts. Reprise, performed by Paige Beller. Special thanks to Chris Karwowski and WYSL Radio in Yellow Springs, Ohio. The Novelizers is a work of parody, unauthorized by Warner Brothers. Follow The Novelizers on Instagram, Threads, Facebook, and TikTok. And please donate to our Patreon. Copyright 2024, Novelizers, LLC. There was a matrix made of computers. There was a guy who could dodge all the bullets He lived in fluid, just like a fetus But he was born again like baby Jesus Andy, you're back. I just forgot my phone charger. I'm not even here.